Welcome, everyone. My name is Lisa Thavet. I'm a Montessori consultant by day, the founder of Tilt Think Improv by night, and a proud member of the National Writers Series Board. I'm so pleased to welcome you to this event with David Blight, who wrote Frederick Douglass, Prophet of Freedom. This book has been awarded the Pulitzer Prize for History. It has been described as the definitive dramatic biography of the most important African American of the 19th century. Frederick Douglass, an escaped slave, became the greatest orator of his day and a leading force to abolish slavery. Now in normal times, we would have welcomed David Blight at the beautiful City Opera House in downtown Traverse City, Michigan, before an audience of, of hundreds. We can't wait to usher you back into a live space, but until then, we hope you enjoy this virtual event via Zoom. David will be talking with Rochelle Riley, author of The Burden, African Americans and the Enduring Impact of Slavery. This promises to be a terrific conversation. But before we get started, I wanna say this event would not be possible without our, our incredible sponsors and donors who have kept us going during these tough times. Please watch this video created by Ben Whiting, who is a corporate trainer, a national speaker, and a magician slash storyteller. He also happens to sit on our National Writers Series board, and he is a key part of our great virtual tech team. So take it away, Ben. Thanks so much, Ben. I'd now like to introduce our guest host, Rochelle Riley. Rochelle is the Director of Arts and Culture for the City of Detroit and formerly a nationally syndicated columnist for the Detroit Free Press. She's known for advocating for improved race relations, literacy, community building, and children. Rochelle Riley has appeared on major television networks and worked for the Washington Post, the Dallas Morning News, the Dallas Times Herald and the Louisville Courier Journal, where she became the newspaper's first African-American news executive. Her columns about former Detroit Mayor Kwame Kilpatrick were part of the entry that won the 2009 Pulitzer Prize in local reporting. She's notable for mentoring future journalists to ensure that newsrooms reflect the diversity of their communities earning her the Ida B. Wells Award from the National Association of Black Journalists and Northwestern University. She strongly advocates for press freedom and has helped to raise nearly $2 million for literacy causes in Michigan. We're so pleased Rochelle is with us this evening as our host, and she is a constant supporter and friend of the National Writers Series. David Blight is a teacher, scholar, and public historian working at Yale University as the Sterling Professor of History. He is also director of the Gilder Lehrman Center for the Study of Slavery, Resistance, and Abolition. His book, Frederick Douglass, has garnered nine book awards, among them the Pulitzer Prize, the Francis Parkman Prize, and the Bancroft Prize. The book has also been optioned as a feature film. David is a frequent book reviewer and commentator for the New York Times, NPR, and The Atlantic. He holds a doctorate from the University of Wisconsin-Madison and did his undergraduate degree at Michigan State University. He's also taught at Harvard University, at North Central College in Naperville, Illinois, and for seven years as a public high school teacher in his hometown of Flint, Michigan. 
David, we're so happy to welcome you back to the Mitten, even if it's just virtually. So now I'm pleased to turn this conversation over to Rochelle Riley and David Blight. I just wanna say good evening to our guests and good evening to a professor who has done a profound work. I am so pleased to participate in this. So I have to say, this is a copy of the book. It looks like a cookbook with all the favorite recipes marked in it, as you can see from my post-its. And part of that, uh, David, is because it is amazing in detail and stories and things that I did not know. So. I have to ask, you have spent your life studying Frederick Douglass, arguably one of the most famous African-American men in U.S. history and in the world. He was the most photographed African-American man of his time. Beautiful, leontine future features. I felt the way um, some of his admirers, female admirers did. And he was one of the greatest abolitionists and writers ever. So how did this kid from Flint, who became a Yale professor, make this choice to spend this amount of time studying this man? Why Douglas? Well, thank you, first of all, Rochelle, and thank you to all of the National Writers Series staff and leaders and donors, and hello, everybody around Traverse City. I wish, indeed, we were there in person. Uh, I did grow up in Flint, and I, I don't think I've been in Traverse City since I was about 12 years old, which is sad to say. Um, uh, and this is a bit of going home for me. I, I love anything that returns me to Michigan, even if it's only in the imagination. Um, how did this happen? I don't know. Uh, it, you know, I was in college in the late 1960s. I graduated from Michigan State in 71. I took the first ever black history course taught at Michigan State, at least I think it was, in either 68 or 69. It was taught by Les Rout who was African-American, although his, his field, his scholarly field was Latin America and particularly the history of Brazil. But Les taught this, this amazing course in black history. And, and frankly, none of us had ever had any. I did, I did not have anything in a concerted way about the black experience in high school, even though I had two great high school history teachers. Uh, and then I became a teacher in Flint and we were all creating something called black history courses and frankly, without knowing what we were doing. Uh, I remember getting my public library, not public library, the school library at Flint Northern, to buy uh, multiple copies of John Hope Franklin's From Slavery to Freedom. There, there we had a textbook. And I remember getting them to buy multiple copies of Kenneth Stamp's The Peculiar Institution, which at that point happened to be one book I knew about slavery, even though it was published back in the 1950s. And we started, sort of went from there. And honest to God, I don't think I even discovered Douglas until I was a high school teacher. Uh, back then, I even bought a poster that I still have here. It still hangs in my apartment. One of those posters you get from the scholastic resource companies. And what I, what I still love about it, and the reason it's framed up on the wall, is not only the photo of Douglas, which I love, but it has his wrong birth date on it, and it gives him a middle initial that he never had. So it's, it's one of those, you know, uh, collector's items because of the mistakes on the poster. But it was in graduate school that I locked on to Douglas. I went off to Wisconsin at that point in the late 1970s. I wanted to study abolitionism. I particularly wanted to study black abolitionists. And quite quickly, I landed on Douglas in part because he left the most sources. He left the most writing to work with and my dissertation, uh, which became my first book, called Frederick Douglass's Civil War, uh, was uh, a work on Douglass. And uh, I've done other things on Douglass over the years, and I had Douglass pretty much out of my life until about uh, 14 years ago, when I went to Savannah, Georgia, to give a talk on Douglass's narrative to middle and high school teachers. And there I met the collector, Walter Evans. Uh, a chance encounter, my host introduced me to him. He took me over to his house. He showed me portions of his magnificent collection of Douglas manuscripts, which he had been collecting since the early 1980s. 
And it took me some time to commit to this. There, was, there wasn't just this road to Damascus moment, but uh, that collection, which we perhaps could talk about a bit more, is the reason that I then chose to attempt a full life of Douglas. So all praise to Walter and Linda Evans, who became my patrons and my dear friends. And without that collection, I would have never written this book. Well, I was going to ask about Walter Evans, because uh, when you're a historian and you're someone who's mining data and looking for things, to come across someone like that is just truly amazing. Yeah. And if you could um, just tell our viewers a little bit about what that was like and what it looked like when you met this man who had this amazing treasure trove. Yes, it was extraordinary. Uh, and the collection is extraordinary. And as many people may know, if they read the New York Times, as of two days ago, <laughs> Which I did. it has finally been announced. That's been in the making for many, many, many months. But it has finally been announced that the Evans Douglas collection is being uh, processed as we speak here at the Beinecke Rare Book and Manuscript Library at Yale, which is one of the world's great research libraries. It took many, many years to court Walter to sell his Douglas collection here to Yale, but it is finally here. And that to me is a triumph. But the collection itself is so important, and it was so important to me as a biographer, because the heart of it uh, consists of about nine very large family scrapbooks that were kept by Douglas's, two of Douglas's sons in particular. He had four surviving adult children. They all had a hand in these scrapbooks, but particularly Lewis and uh, Frederick Jr. were the scrapbookers. And they, over the last 30 years of their father's life, from about the end of the Civil War to when he died, they cataloged his life and their own lives. And this treasure trove that's in these scrapbooks becomes a window into that latter third of Frederick Douglass's life like we had never had before. And into, it, in, and into the lives of his extended family. Four surviving children, 21 grandchildren, even some fictive siblings and other kinds of hangers on that were always around Douglass. Uh, the Evans collection is full of family letters, family documents, even two handwritten narratives by two of the sons about growing up in the Douglas household, which are absolute uh, treasures for a biographer. But I think above all, it opened up this latter third of a man's life. If Americans tend to know Douglas at all, they, although they're getting to know him much better now, uh, they tend to know the young Douglas, you know, the heroic escaped slave who wrote the famous narrative, who became a, a great orator even in his 20s or in his 30s. But that, that aging Douglas, the older man who moves to Washington, D.C., who gets three appointments in the federal government, who becomes a kind of political insider in the government to a degree and in the Republican Party to an even greater degree. You know, over the years, he didn't seem as interesting to a lot of people. But to me, that almost took over the book. Uh, it turns out uh, aging can be fascinating. Uh, and in this case, it's a man who became a patriarch of this huge family, always a struggling family, always a family with very modern conflicts. And it's the story of an old radical outsider who becomes, to some degree at least, a kind of political insider. He's really the prototype of that experience especially for African-American leaders. And we know many other cases like that in the 20th century. Uh, so there was so much that I learned from the Evans collection that anybody that looks at the footnotes of my book will see hundreds and hundreds of citations to that collection. And I spent, uh, oh, I don't even know how many weeks I spent in Savannah, uh, many spring break weeks, uh, many other weeks, working on Linda and Walter's dining room table. I mean, it's, uh, you mentioned what an extraordinary, you know, bit of luck this was, and it really was luck. I just happened to bump into this. I was not the first scholar to ever see Walter's collection, but I was the first to really use it. And now there are, meant, there are oh, a, at least a couple of handfuls of other scholars who have gone to Savannah, have gone through Walter's initiations, and have spent time, uh, a great deal of time, at the dining room table.
Well, congratulations on being the first to use it. It was used wisely. Um, I, I do want us to spend some time on him uh, as, as the elder statesman, but I want to start at the beginning. I can tell you, when I got this assignment from the National Writers Series, I immediately picked up and reread uh, the first book, The Narrative of the Life of Frederick Douglass, one of his three autobiographies, because I wanted his voice in my head. As it turns out, I didn't need to do that because you describe the book as a biography of a voice and his voice is throughout this entire volume. Mm -hmm. How important was that to you and why did you choose to do it that way? Because it's not a chronological, just, you know, standard bare obituary or biography. It's an examination of different times uh, where his voice spoke in different ways. How did you come to that? Well, I love that question, Rochelle, because it was the voice. Uh, I was not only trying to capture, but it is the most important thing about Douglas. Douglas was a man of words, a creature of words, a genius with language. We wouldn't be here talking about him if it weren't for the millions, literally millions of words that he wrote. He wrote 1,200 pages of autobiography. He wrote hundreds and hundreds of the short form political editorials. He mastered that form. He wrote one novella in the early 1850s called The Heroic Slave, and would that he had found time to perhaps write more fiction, although some have claimed that any great autobiographer is already writing, to a degree, fiction. And then there are the thousands of speeches uh, for which in some ways he's most famous. Uh, just, you know, millions of words. And I should say, too, here, though he was first an orator, he was first a, a craftsman of the spoken word. He became a writer. It wasn't right away. I mean, writing was not simple for him. This is the man, of course, with no formal education, none. Uh, he's not entirely self-taught. He had mentors, he had teachers, but not in any schoolroom any time in his life. But he, I think, in the end, was most self-conscious that he became a creature of the pen. Um, and it was the power of the pen, the power of words, that he came to understand were his only real weapon. It's the only real power he ever really had. Um, so I actually at one point wanted to, <laughs> wanted to make the title of the book, Frederick Douglass, Biography of a Voice. Uh, but my editor uh, quite wisely probably said, no, 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 can't do that. Sounds too literary, you know, you'll confuse your reader. Uh, but in a sense, that is what it became. Now, the, the risk there, of course, is you could have a biography that just catalogs Douglas's words over and over and over, and you can't do that either. Uh, but the trick was always weaving in Douglas's words, whether they're retrospective words in autobiography or whether they're actual letters or actual speeches, at the same time telling the chronological story of his life and telling about the times, the incredibly turbulent times in which he lived and on which he had tremendous impact. Well, you're talking about his voice and I'm hoping uh, to give readers and to give viewers and all those people who are going to buy the book after this conversation, just a glimpse into his voice. And I wanted to ask if you would read something that is so powerful from his early life. It's on page it's on page 47, uh, The Silver Trump of Knowledge. And it speaks to him uh, sort of being unforgettably eloquent about his circumstances. Yes, this comes in a section of the first narrative where he is remembering. Uh, this is the, the perils of Zooming these days. Uh, <laughs> Never would have happened on that opera house stage. Not anyway, one. Now this comes in the, in the moment in the narrative, the first autobiography, he's only 27 years old, remembering his achievement of literacy, and yet he does it so honestly. He says, you know, my literacy caused tremendous discontent, tremendous fear. What was I gonna do with all this literacy? How could I use it? He even says at one point, I envied my more ignorant fellow slaves their ignorance. But then he floats into this passage, which is the one I think you wanted me to read. Uh, I have often wished myself a beast, he says. I preferred the condition of the meanest reptile to my own. <clears throat> Anything, no matter what, to get rid of thinking. 
It was this everlasting thinking of my condition that tormented me. There was no getting rid of it. It pressed upon me by every object within sight or hearing, animate or inanimate. The silver trump of freedom had aroused my soul to eternal wakefulness. Freedom now appeared to disappear no more forever. It was heard in every sound and seen in every thing. It was ever present to torment me with a sense of my wretched condition. I saw nothing without seeing it. I heard nothing without hearing it and felt nothing without feeling it. It looked from every star. It smiled in every calm, it breathed in every wind, and moved in every storm. That's the torment of beginning to know what freedom might be, but not being able to attain it. It's the discovery of what, uh, what liberation of the mind might be, but not being able to reach it. Uh, this is one section well, there's so many, but it's one section where we can truly hear him as a prose poet. This is poetry in the form of prose. And mm, several times in the book, I call Douglas the prose poet of American democracy. Absolutely apt. And this is one of the most powerful passages in American literature that I can remember. So I was glad to see it in your book. Yeah. There are dozens, literally dozens and dozens and dozens of tingle producing discoveries that you present in the book. Some of them appear briefly like shooting stars, but are powerful and some are of great magnitude, such as Douglas learning uh, after his mother's death that she could read or his paying a dollar and 50 cent poll tax to register to vote right. either 1839 or 1840. How did you decide which details to include or did you just include everything? <laughs> That's a great question. Uh, no, I did not include everything, but uh, the longer this book became, uh, there are a lot of them there. Uh, we had some battles about length. Uh, the, the Evans collection was itself a tremendous source of anecdotes, uh, new facts, uh, new moments, sometimes just little narrative moments. That uh, discovery of the poll tax, they're paying that tax to register to vote uh, within one year probably of his escape from slavery was actually mentioned first in another book. Uh, but I went to the New Bedford uh, City Hall and looked it all up and there was his name, Frederick Douglass, wow. $1.50. Uh, he registered to vote. He was 21 years old. Uh, there are many, many others. Sometimes they were just realizations of where he was at a given time, of who he would meet. Uh, sometimes they were just moments of humor, of almost comic relief in this life of unrelenting encounters with racism. Uh, he, you know, he got Jim Crowed more times than he could ever count. I and love that verb. Every time I read that, I said, I have to use that. Yeah, well, he did. He got Jim Crow in restaurants, on trains, on river boats, on steamers, in, you know, in taverns and so on. And one of the ways he survived all of this is that as he got a little older anyway, he would begin to process some of it by humor. I mean, to survive. There's, there's a case in the book I used, I had even more than one of these, where he gets Jim Crow in a restaurant, part of a hotel, uh, it's after the Civil War. He's out in the Midwest. I forget where now. Michigan, maybe Iowa, maybe. I don't remember. But he gets Jim Crow. The manager won't sit him in the dining room. And he says, sorry, sir, you can't eat here. You'll have to eat in the kitchen. And I got this out of a newspaper, a clipping in the Evans collection. And Douglas t uh, apparently stood up in the middle of the restaurant in his booming voice and said, where do the dogs eat? Show me your dogs, I'll eat with your dogs. And pretty soon, all the patrons in the restaurant are on his side, they have sympathy for him, and they're all on their feet saying, no, sit the man with us, let him eat. You know, that, those kinds of little anecdotes are what actually make a good story. They make a good, uh, uh, they make good biographical moments. I'll give you one other one that I found in a clipping in the Evans collection that I am so fond of. He's in Iowa City, I remember this one. Uh, it's, a, it's 1869, because I know the speech he had just given was a bit of a dud. 
it, this was the year he was trying to do history speeches and they didn't always work. And he's sitting in the train station looking dead tired, which is entirely believable. And a reporter for a Milwaukee newspaper comes up to him and says, Mr. Douglas, so honored to see you. Your speech last night, it didn't seem to be you. He didn't seem to have it. And Douglas's response, according to the reporter, was, well, you know, if I really belt it out like I used to, I have false teeth now and I'd lose my teeth. You and just took my kicker. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. No, but it's it's in there. telling it, so I didn't want to stop you. It's my favorite passage in the book. As a oh, my God. Novelist. But you know, it didn't end there, as you probably no, remember. Because then the reporter asks him, so, Mr. Douglas, what's the hardest part of being out on these endless speaking tours? And Douglas's response was, having to talk to people like you. <laughs> <laughs> Which I've heard many times. I bet you have. As a journalist, you, you've had to endure that one, I'm sure. <laughs> anyway, it's that kind of stuff that you get out of, especially newspaper clipping, that, that help you tell a story. There, there are more important facts in this book that were new especially about his relationships with his sons, his two wives, uh, other people in his life. Uh, lots of new revelations here about uh, friendships, rivalries, uh, and the like. Well, I can tell you the book is not just an examination of his life and his voice, but a retelling of his autobiographies and filling in history and detail that has not been seen or explored so deeply. So this is gonna be a long question. We're talking about details of his preaching, the first time a white abolitionist reached out, the many people who tried to take credit for discovering him, being the only African-American at the Seneca Falls Women's Suffrage Convention, his meeting Harriet Beecher Stowe right after the successful publication of Uncle Tom's Cabin, meeting John Brown before the Harper's Ferry Raid and deciding at the last minute not to accompany him to certain death, the many different ways he found to advance his intellectual prowess, his unusual household with his wife and another woman, meeting Booker T. Washington, meeting James Weldon Johnson. There was so, meeting Ida B. Wells, my, my heroine and hero. Oh, yeah. So talk about what it felt like to, I mean, he is the exact opposite of incidental, so you can't liken him to Forrest Gump, but no. he is a part of every major historical event for almost a century. What was that like to, to find all of those different things and write about them the way that you did? Well, first of all, uh, he did tend to meet everybody of importance, especially from the Civil War on. Um, and he had a, a particularly uh, acute problem with fame. Uh, what we would call celebrity today, they didn't use that word in the 19th century. It's like the word racism. They didn't, use, they didn't really use that word in the 19th century, although they meant the same thing. Uh, Douglas had a serious problem with fame. He couldn't go anywhere. He was so visible. Part of this was because of how many photographs had been taken of him. And perhaps Ben would put up uh, the first or the second, if he hasn't already, of a half dozen images I brought of Douglas. Uh, he, uh, and maybe even go to the second one, if you would, Ben. Yeah. Uh, this was this was a stunning young man, and he worked carefully on that hair. I can assure you. Uh, in fact, Ben, if you might go to the third one, is even there. That profile. This, this is a photo from 1857, we believe. Uh, and so, his visage, his his visual presence, uh, was part of his fame. But that's only one small part of it. Um, it the fame was really rooted in the oratory and the writing. His autobiographies, the first and second, uh, sold very, very well. In fact, they were bestsellers by 19th century standards. And uh, his oratory, you know, his speeches are, not, are impossible to even count. He would go on lecture tours of three and four months at a time and deliver a lecture at least every other day for years on end. And it became a kind of an, um, an American phenomenon to see Douglas, to go hear Douglas. You know, Elvis was in town <laughs> or, or whomever, you know, Beyonce was in town. Uh, maybe that's stretching a 19th century, I mean, a, a 21st century analogy too far. But he does meet all of these people at different stages of his life 
and they know they are meeting this person of great symbolism. Uh, whether it's meeting Booker T. Washington when Washington is young and Douglas is quite old, or whether it's much earlier, of course, his encounters with Lincoln, uh, his encounters with all the famous abolitionists, with some of whom he had terrible rivalries and difficult relationships. And of course, he had strong and sometimes conflicted relationships with the leaders of the women's movement, the women's rights movement, from Seneca Falls on, where he was a, a, a very important participant, the only black male speaker at the Seneca Falls Convention in 1848. And he has a big blow up, a big you know, fight with Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Susan Anthony in particular after the 15th Amendment was passed. Um, but, you know, it, it, there are so many moments in his life that you could stop on forever. His relationships with Ulysses Grant, for example, which were not that rosy. Yeah. Um, and then other later Republican presidents. He had a relationship with all of them. And to me, one of the most fascinating things is how he had really, he had, he had important relationships with the next generation of black leaders after the Civil War, but often quite contentious because it was a classic situation of the next generation wanting to knock the old man off. This was not the case, though, with Ida Wells. Now, they did not always agree on everything, and they were both strong personalities, but this was almost like a father-daughter relationship and, a, and an intellectual father-daughter relationship. He was very much a mentor to her in her early career of anti-lynching activism and helped introduce her all over England when she went over there. But then they, they collaborated famously, of course, at the Chicago World's Fair on that great pamphlet they wrote together, uh, Why the Negro is Not at the Columbian Exposition. So he had relationships with almost everybody who mattered. And I'll say one last thing about that. One of the things, when you do biography, as you know from a lot of your writing, you, you live with a subject long enough, there's some things you come to actually know about your subject and you're confident about it. Other things you're not. You just can't quite know. One thing I know about Douglas, if he met you, he would figure out very quickly what he could learn from you. Because it was people who were his education. Books and people. Yeah, he was a book collector and a voracious reader, of course, of many different kinds of books, uh, many different traditions. But if he met you, he'd figure out, what can I learn from you? And sometimes when he thought he had learned all he could, he kind of discarded people, which, is, which, which doesn't always build great you know, relationships over time. Uh, but he was a learner from people. I, I noticed that throughout the book, and it was amazing that people still loved him, even though he yeah. no longer had use for them. Um, he was not I, always I, easy to get along with. He was a very sensitive, exactly. hypersensitive guy. Uh, I want us to get to some of the questions from the audience, but first I sure. want to ask this one. Um, as we face the greatest revolution since the civil, the civil rights rebellions of the 60s and maybe the Civil War itself, we have to look back at Abraham Lincoln, whom Douglas had this love, you know, hate every now and again, they'd get mad relationship. Mm -hmm. uh, Lincoln blamed the war on black people saying, but for your race among us, there could not be war. And uh, he invited black people to leave and form their own colony elsewhere. How might, how we, you know, how we wish for Douglas's words now or someone mm. who rose to that level to speak about these things, but with his voice in your head and his history in your rear view, what do you think will happen in America next? And would Frederick Douglass have foreseen it? I know you've been asked numerous times, what would Frederick Douglass say? Because you know him, uh, his voice, but. Well, uh, yeah, it, that's of course, uh, difficult and impossible, but unavoidable these days. We don't know what Douglas would do now. He might just come to us and say, you know, I died 130 some years ago and you all are still at this for God's sake, you know. On the other hand, he might not be that surprised because Douglas came to view history in the long view. He really did. And he had had, he had encountered many ups and far more downs in the trajectory of Black freedom, black civil and political rights, uh, dignity, acceptance of their humanity, and so on. 
Uh, I think, Douglas, if he were around today, what we would hope he would do, what we would most want from him is what he gave the 19th century, and that is a prophetic voice. A prophetic voice in the sense that, and I, and I struggled in this book for quite a long time about whether to use that word prophet on Douglas, because that's a big word. Yes. And I learned you don't throw that word around softly. Uh, but some theologian friends of mine helped me uh, with a lot of theological reading, and I finally got comfortable with it because I came to learn from the theologians like Walter Brueggemann and, the and um, Abraham Heschel, that especially in, in, in the tradition of the Hebrew prophets, which Douglas read so closely, a prophet is that person who somehow finds the words, the language, to capture our experience for us that we can't quite capture on our own. Or as Abraham Heschel said, the true prophet can hear words and use them one octave higher than the rest of us can hear. They find the language to explain a catastrophe, to explain a pivot in history, you know, a reckoning like we're having now. And do we ever yearn now for, for someone like a king yeah, maybe like a Du Bois, like somebody, to, and Douglas, to step in and say, all right, here's how this fits in our history. Here's how this finds a place in what has come before. It is not entirely new. Yes, it is new in some ways, but it is not entirely new. And if you don't keep a long view, uh, you know, you, you may you may all but kill yourselves in trying to deal with this situation. Um, it's that kind of prophetic voice that we would hope for from Douglas. I also think if he were around, he'd probably want to go harness those protests. He'd want to harness young people. He'd encourage them. And he'd want to harness them into politics. Douglas was all about the right to vote. Some, some even said he overstressed the right to vote over against other kinds of economic issues and economic liberty. But he would be trying to harness this incredible fervor right now into voting, into new coalitions that would truly transform not just the law, but the society. Well, I think we've learned that he was not wrong, that uh, economic... Yeah and power and everything comes with the vote. We have several uh, wonderful audience members who are all asking around the same question. Yeah. Um, and it's about his ability to travel, not just how much he traveled, but whether oh. he had to have companions. And it reminded me of the story where he and his white companion and their seat on the rail on the train yeah, right. were all thrown off. Can you talk a little bit about how, how he was able to travel, particularly you know, during that time where you know, he yeah. could have been harmed? Oh, he was harmed. A few yeah, times. Well, killed because uh, he was harmed. Yeah, and threatened many others. But uh, yeah, there, there's a place in the book where I speculate that he may have traveled more miles than any American of the 19th century, with the exception probably of Mark Twain. And Twain went to Asia, so you know that sort of skews it. But Douglas traveled all the time from his earliest days on the anti-slavery circuit in the early 1840s right on down to the last months of his life. He was in the fall of 1894, he was still doing a Midwest speaking tour with his speech against lynching, the one called Lessons of the Hour. He's 76 years old at that point, which is, is quite old in the 19th century. And he had heart disease and his hands were shaking. Um, he traveled every way you can imagine. He'd love, by the way, and was enthralled, as I suspect most people were, with steamships and steamship travel. And he would measure the time of a, of a trip. Uh, in, 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 when I was doing this book, when I was in the 1840s, I at one point had to stop and I decided I had to go learn more about stagecoaches. I had to learn about carriages, because this is how he's traveling. What was a stagecoach, you know, in 1844? Uh, it turns out there's a lot out there on that, and they were not pleasant things to ride in, and the roads were terrible. And I even learned a lot about railroad maps just to try to figure out, did the railroad even go to that town 
In many cases, the answer is no. So how did he get there? Well, a carriage, maybe a stagecoach, horseback, or on foot. Now, later on, it's train travel. I mean, he was a creature of the railroads. Now, the truth is he traveled most of the time through all of these years. His oratorical career is like 52 years. Uh, he traveled most of the time alone. That's late in life, late in life, when he was touring, even in the deep south and all over the country, he traveled with a son-in-law. And at one point, actually, a grandson-in-law, who was the husband of one of his granddaughters, uh, who became his traveling companion. And he would insist on whoever invited him to speak had to pay his small fee and his transportation, but also the transportation of the grandson-in-law. Um, but he encountered all kinds of the agonies of travel in these years, the soot of railroads, the back-breaking travel on stagecoaches. But an abolitionist like Douglas, and then after the Civil War, an itinerant lecturer had to go where the people were. And I'll say one last thing about the Evans collection. My goodness, the scrapbooks cataloged his travels. In the, in, by the middle of the 1880s, the family actually hired a clipping service. It was called the American Bureau. I didn't even know it existed. And these, clip, these clippings would come back, all had the little imprint at the top, American Bureau, American Bureau. And they were from all kinds of small towns across the country, because everywhere he went, the local press would, would report. So I was able to put together travel itineraries, although some scholars before me had done some of this as well. And it is hard to believe uh, the distances he traveled. A typical midwinter lecture tour by Douglas in the 1870s, 1880s, even into the early 90s, uh, was between three and 4,000 miles. In fact, anyone who wants to pick up this book, look in the index for Traverse City. Because in January of an 1880s, I'm forgetting the actual year right now, in January of an 1880s lecture trip that he began in New York State, he got stranded first in Western New York by a blizzard. And he kept going because his destination was Traverse City, Michigan. Wow. He gave a speech on a church in Traverse City, Michigan, turned, then turned back south to Chicago, over to Wisconsin, out into Iowa, and by the time he got home, I calculated about 3,500 miles. But he actually lectured in Traverse City in late January. Don't ask me why. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have a question from my friend E.R. Ship, who teaches at Morgan State University. But it mirrors a couple of other questions that have to do with Frederick Douglass sort of being, uh, if he had lived in the 1980s instead of the uh, 1800s, uh, being a Mac Daddy and uh, having <laughs> some very unusual relationships with women. So yes. some younger women say that Douglas should not be so exalted because he mistreated his black wife. And others question this whole relationship where he had a woman in love with him living in the house with Anna mm -hmm. Mary Douglas mm -hmm. and Great Bard. So can you, can you talk a little bit about that? Because all of that's in there too. Oh, it is in there. Well, I don't want to take up all the rest of our time on this question, but we surely could. Uh, these are very complicated relationships. He was married to Anna Murray, 44 years. Uh, she's the mother of all five of their children. The fifth one, Annie, died at age 11. Anna remained uh, a non-reader and writer all of her life. Uh, there are no sources that we have to work with in Anna's hands, uh, from Anna's hands. But I have to tell you, one of the great challenges of this book, and anybody who wants to work on Douglas, is getting to Anna. And there are ways. Those reminiscences by the children. There are three uh, reminiscences written by their old, oldest, their daughter Rosetta, and by two of the sons that are very revealing about their mother. There are also a number of letters by the children to their father and the father to the children about Anna. Mm -hmm. uh, there are comments by other people about Anna. And I did my utmost to make Anna real and to humanize her in this book. I even used one modern poet uh, to kind of help me get at Anna. Um, but anyway, 
Yes, there uh, were two other European women in Douglas's life. Uh, the first was uh, uh, Julia Griffiths, an English woman he met in his tour of England in, the, in 1845 to 47, who came over to the U.S. and lived for six years in Rochester, uh, where the, when Douglas was still quite young and when he just began his newspaper, The North Star. Julia became the, in effect, assistant editor of the newspaper. She was his principal fundraiser. She was his editor. He thanked her many times openly for her blue pencil. She helped improve his spelling and his writing. And she was, if anything, the most important confidant friend about his role as a public abolitionist of all. She did live in the Douglas home for three years until uh, enemies of Douglas uh, blew this up as a scandal and, and Julia had to move out for the next three years she was in Rochester. Now, was that one a sexual relationship? We do not know. My own best guess is that it was not. That's a guess. Mm -hmm. Cannot prove that. What I do know is that Julia Griffiths was an extremely important confidant and friend of Douglas's. And readers will see me develop that in the book. Then there comes a second woman who remained in Douglas's life uh, on and off for over 22, 23 years, a German woman named Otelia Ossing, who <laughs> is a long and complicated story, but the brief part, the brief version is she was a brilliant uh, journalist, writer, poet. Uh, German Jew, though not a practicing Jew. In fact, she was a ferocious atheist. Uh, she came from a German 48er family, uh, the, the Republican revolutions of 1848. Uh, her own father had died in prison. But she came to America as a journalist to cover the American abolition movement. And she especially wanted to cover black abolitionists. And when she read My Bondage and My Freedom in 1855, the second autobiography, she was in effect knocked out of her shoes. She traveled out to Rochester, New York, and essentially knocked on the door and said, can I interview you? And then tried, in effect, to never leave. Uh, she lived in Hoboken, New Jersey, but she would come and spend parts of summers, not every summer, but parts of some summers from the late 1850s, it fell off during the war, and then again in the 1870s, she would come and spend as much as two and three months in the Douglas household in Rochester with Douglas's family and with Anna. Was this awkward? Was this difficult? You bet it was. What do we really know about Douglas's relationship with Otilia Ossing? Only what Ossing tells us. Not a single letter by Douglas to Ossing survives. We do know that he wrote a lot of letters to Ossing, but they were burned, destroyed, uh, by her, probably. And uh, we have, but we have a lot of her letters, almost 200 of them that she wrote to her sister back in Europe. And it is from those letters, all of which I had translated, although others had translated them before me, but I had my own translations done so that I could, I could know these letters carefully. Um, and what we have is a relationship that probably on and off, and again, I can't prove it, probably on and off was sexual over the years. Um, Anna didn't die until 1882 after long illness. And uh, when she died in 1882, uh, Douglas went to pieces. Uh, he had a breakdown, I think the second major breakdown of his life. The first one came back in the early 1850s. That's developed in the book. But Douglas had by then, uh, let's just put it this way, ended whatever it was with Ossing. Ossing had tried to get him to go to Europe with her, at least as a vacation, if not even to move there. He never did. He never was going to do that. So she finally moved back to Europe. Uh, and eventually uh, spent up most of her inheritance and uh, contracted breast cancer and died, of, died by suicide in a park in Paris in 1884. However, she did leave a separate $10,000 um, gift 
to Douglas and his family. It's a long, very complicated relationship. I argue in the book that what Douglas got from this, I think we can know this much at least, is a very important intellectual companion at times in a world where he didn't have very many of them or any at times. Uh, Asing even became quite close with Douglas's children. Although she was, and it has to be said, and I say it in the book, not a pleasant woman. Uh, she said horrible things about Anna Douglas, and at times she said horrible things. It's stunning things. to me that someone could, well, yeah. that, that could have been a whole story in itself. That's the soap opera, but apparently the book has been optioned for a feature film, and <laughs> how it's dealt <laughs> with in that film, you know, who knows, but scares me. <laughs> if you had your druthers, who would play Douglas? Jeffrey Wright. Yeah, and no, no one's going to ask me. That's below my grade in this business. But I, uh, I follow him on Twitter. I'll tweet it out and let him know that you said it. There you go. And uh, I just think that guy has the chops. He just has the gravitas, the voice. I, I just think Jeffrey Wright is a fabulous actor. And he's already done, you know, historical personalities before. He's done King. He's done... Colin Powell, he's done all sorts of people. So I, I think Jeffrey Wright, but, but again, they're not asking me about that. Uh, the film people will, will, will make those decisions. Can I ask you a question about your book? Uh, sure. Well, you know, I read the introduction and in, in particular, uh, because Amazon wouldn't let me read the rest of it. I'm gonna get the book now. <laughs> your copy is on the way. <laughs> well, one of the things that is so compelling about Douglas, and you know this, is the way in which anger, hatred, rage survived in him. And it is a rage born of slavery. It is a rage born of his 20 years as a slave. The brutality both to the body, but especially to the mind. And he said that many, many times. Um, that's in great part what you write about. This kind of enduring uh, legacy of of uh, not just resistance, but rage about the slavery experience that survives in African-American life. I found that so compelling, the way you expressed. And of course, you've put together this amazing book of essays by all sorts of people about what the legacy of slavery means to them. But Douglas had a terrible problem with this, this issue of anger, and he was able to process it in words. And I wonder if that's not what you've done. Well, that's what I had to do as a columnist for 20 years and what so many of my colleagues, no matter what their uh, avocation or vocation, um, have to do. But I can tell you one of the things that I tell people all the time is slavery didn't end. It just changed addresses from the plantations to the courtrooms and newsrooms and boardrooms of America. And James Baldwin had it right to be a Negro in this country and to be relatively conscious means to be in a rage all the time what you have to do is figure out how to channel it, what to do with it. For writers, we can do that. For some sports people, they can do it you know, on the field or on the court. Or, um, but it's almost as if this year in particular with the murder of George Floyd, people got to see what that's like to live like that all the time, yeah. to have those microaggressions that you face every day, mm -hmm. some major aggressions that you face every day. Right. Um, it, it is a real thing. And I think that finally, um, hopefully, we have a moment to do something about it. It's been unchucked from its shell, that's for sure. That's right. a, lot of a lot of Americans are learning about uh, whatever we want to call it, you know, the, the, the leftover legacies of slavery. That, that's too nice a term, actually, because the legacies of slavery take, as you just suggested, all kinds of forms in wealth gaps, in law, in, in voter suppression, in housing, in, in, in education at all kinds of levels. But it's on that emotional level that, you know, we just can't measure it. Uh, and we sometimes can't even know it until something touches it off. And I think we're living one of those moments. We're, we're, living, we're living a world historical moment in the United States. That we don't really know where this is going. Uh, but a lot of people now have ideas of where it ought to go. <laughs> well, it, we're almost out of time. So I did want to uh, ask you to go to a passage. The one thing that uh, Frederick Douglass had no control over and could not write was about his death. 
Yeah. And I thought that was so moving, his last moments. And yeah. I, I, I literally, um, I don't know, I felt a sense of closure. And I wanted to ask if that was also closure for you, this 10-year journey to tell his whole story and then to get to that end. Was that the end of Frederick Douglass for you? So if you could answer that question and read that passage, that would be awesome. And I have to thank all of these folks who, you know, sent all these questions, but we've only got five more minutes. So I'll send them to you. <laughs> well, I'd love to see them. And I know we got a lot of people on the, on the, on the uh, event, and I'm grateful for that. Um, you know, I really struggled with how to end the book. I mean, I had earlier plans of taking him, taking the story beyond death and into a little bit of the legacies and what happened to his home and what about the children. And then I realized, no, 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 no. no. That's a whole new can of words, can of worms. And it's our last four I, minutes, I want people to hear that. And then they could get the book and read about all the rest of it. Well, he dies and the book is over. But my favorite find there, talk about finds was uh, about three weeks before he dies. Uh, Francis Grimke, a minister, young black minister who had actually married him to his second wife, Helen, uh, went to a dinner party at the Douglas House at uh, Cedar Hill. And he tells this story of how when the dinner ended with 12 guests or whatever it was, Douglas gets up and says, let's all sing. And it was a very musical household. Douglas played the violin, but he had a grandson named Joseph who was a great violinist, concert violinist. In fact, Douglas put him through music school. Anyway, Douglas gets everybody into the parlor and he starts leading them all in Rock of Ages. Mm. I mean, that just blew me away. That's stunning. And he, and he says, Joseph started playing Rock of Ages on the violin as Douglas led them through the verses. And so I do at one point quote some of those, or one of those verses. But at the end, I did the last, literally the last words of the book after I've quoted Du Bois's wonderful poem on Douglas, and I've qu quoted Robert Hayden's fantastic poem on Douglas. I just wrote this. Douglas was the prose poet of America's and perhaps of a universal body politic. He searched for the human soul, envisioned through slavery and freedom in all their meanings. There had been no other voice quite like Douglas's. He inspired adoration and rivalry, love and loathing. His work and his words still wear well. What shall we make of our Douglas, which is a phrase Du Bois had used? What shall we make of our Douglas in our time? The problem of the 21st century is still some agonizingly enduring combination of the legacies bleeding forward from slavery and color lines. Freedom in its infinite meanings remains humanity's most universal aspiration. Douglas's life and especially his words may forever serve as our watch warnings in our unending search for the beautiful, needful thing, by which I meant freedom. And that beautiful, needful thing language, of course, comes right off the Robert Hayden poem. Yes. Uh, he died of a heart attack on a day in February, 1895, after he'd attended a women's rights convention that afternoon. And the carriage was waiting outside the door to pick him up, to take him to an AME church where he was that night scheduled to speak again. Never stopped moving. I want to thank you so much, Professor David Blight, for my fourth and most amazing conversation with the National Writer Series. You can get the book everywhere books are sold. You can get The Burden, which comes out in paperback, where okay. books are sold. And my next book, That They Lived, uh, which features a young Frederick Douglass, will be coming out in March. Thank Fantastic. you so much. This was my honor to talk to you. Uh, Rochelle, no, it was my honor. This was, this was a great pleasure. I wish we had another hour. And I oh, wish we would need another five, Professor. Okay, uh, well, next time in Traverse City, or Detroit, next time in Detroit. Next time in Detroit, here's the book. Okay. Do not miss it. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Rochelle.